So welcome everyone to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison, the chair of Rev250's advisory group and Rev250 is a collaboration among 70 organizations in Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the American Revolution. And today our guest is Julie Flavel, who is the author of two great books on British America, actually British America. Her yeah. first is When London Was Capital of America, came out about 10 years ago. And her new one is The Howe Dynasty, the untold story of a military family and the women behind America's war for um, Britain's war for America. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. So the person who really comes across in this book is um, Carolyn Howe, the sister. Yeah. Uh, I hate to call her the sister now that she is such a central figure. And yeah. can you tell us a bit more about how you got into the story and who she is? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, the Howes, I mean, for, for those who are just jumping in here, uh, the Howe family are best known in America for the brothers, Richard Admiral Lord Howe and General Sir William Howe, who were the British commanders in chief in the first years of the American War of Independence. And they've always, the family has always been labeled mysterious. The Howe brothers have always been labeled mysterious. Uh, the main reason being because they didn't manage to quell the British, re the, the American rebellion in, in three years of fighting um, because, this was really considered to be Britain's best chance for winning the war. The French hadn't come in yet. The Americans didn't have a fully professional army and everybody had pushed the war in Britain on the idea that it was going to be easy. So when the, when the brothers failed to stop the rebellion, these, these conspiracy theories came up around them starting in 1778. And they persisted to this day that for some reasons, for divers reasons in ways that we might remind you of trolling nowadays, they were soft on the American rebels deliberately. Mm -hmm. And that's why they failed. So to put the seal on all that, the how papers were destroyed in a fire in the early 19th century. So military historians love to say there's nothing we can know about their private lives. They're a mm -hmm. mysterious lot. And then they move on. And so I was looking, actually looking for material for another project. And I went to the letters of their sister, Caroline, in the British Library. Now, her correspondence with Lady Georgiana Spencer, who was her closest friend, is the longest collection of private letters in the British Library. These two women wrote to each other over a period of more than 50 years. Lady Georgiana Spencer was the mother of the Duchess of Devonshire. Some people may know Amanda Foreman's book about the Duchess and uh, the, the film which stars Kira Knightley as the Duchess. Um, so, so Caroline was best friends with the Duchess's mother. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this correspondence, as I say, I went to it for another reason. And to my surprise, in all these letters was, was a, a, a history of the Howe family, mm -hmm. um, you know, just in, in full living color. And, and it had, it has, it, those, these letters have been dipped into by military historians. But there's no doubt that if Caroline had been a brother, mm -hmm. they would have been gone through with a fine tooth comb. Yeah. And instead, uh, so I decided that I was gonna write a history of the so-called mysterious Howe family and they weren't going to be mysterious anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the leading characters is Caroline herself. She's a very yeah. vivid person. And she was an example of what was called a politically in involved Georgian lady. Mm -hmm. Because in, in Georgian England, um, in a society where there were probably at most 10,000 families running the political scene, um, the main political actors were among these 10,000 families. Um, proximity was power. Mm -hmm. So women who were members of these families who wished to exert drawing room influence and influence behind the scenes, mm -hmm you know, found ways and means of doing so. And Caroline was an example of this. Mm -hmm. So she was actually very involved in her brother's careers. Yeah. yeah. You have also, have, uh, you know, and it's tricky because women can't run for parliament, but then there's a wonderful episode when their mother places an ad in a newspaper about her son. <laughs> yeah. Tells, that's a fascinating story about, you know, how seats in parliament were um, chosen. So. Yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, uh, the, Caroline's mother, um, Lady Charlotte Howe, Viscountess Howe, she was actually the illegit the niece of George the First, King George the First, mm -hmm. through his illegitimate half sister. So she wow. had royal blood, and and she was at court. And uh, I I don't know. New Englanders may know the story of George Lord Howe, another one of the Howe yes. sons. 
who was killed at Fort Ticonderoga in 1758 in, yes. a, in a failed attempt to take the fort from the French. Um, he, he was a highly popular officer with colonial soldiers too. Because Ma Massachusetts was, built a monument to him in Westminster Abbey. That's right, they did. And, and, he, and he also introduced light techniques, you know, I, I, American Indian style fighting techniques into the British army. So when he was killed at Ticonderoga, he was only in early, his early thirties. Um, of course that vacated his parliamentary seat. Um, and so to, to answer your question about how parliament worked, how parliamentary elections worked then, the Duke of Newcastle, a, a consummate political schemer, um, took the event of, of this poor young man's death to try to jump in and install a favorite of his as MP for Nottingham in the empty seat. Mm -hmm. And a lady how in the midst of her bereavement saw that he was going to do this. And so she instantly put an, a, a notice in the Nottingham newspapers appealing to them and saying as a grieving mother, I beg you to install my son, William. This, this is the William who would become the general in the American War of yeah, Independence. Yeah. And Newcastle just threw his hands up and yeah, said, yeah. you know, okay, you know, that's how yeah, yeah. he goes. So, so that's how William became MP for Nottingham. Hmm. Wow. wow. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, a, it's also a very interesting story because um, one of the rules about women being involved behind the scenes in, po in politics in, in, the, in the days when politics really was a man's world was that they must never appear in public. They must never appear to be doing anything for self. It always had to be family and they really had to keep out of the public eye. And, mm -hmm. and so um, the fact that Charlotte was able to do this and people thought she was wonderful shows that she understood. I mean, if she'd lived nowadays, she, she understood how to, oh, yeah. how to deal with the media because oh, yeah. she was held up as the, the type of a, of a stiff upper lip grieving British widow. Yeah. Um, instead of being seen as a pushing, unfeminine yeah. Yeah, thing. Yeah, I want to get my yeah. son and my other son into parliament. Yeah, that was... Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, I appeal to you, she wrote that's in the right. letter. Yeah. Yeah. It was reprinted yeah. for many years afterwards. Yeah, yeah. And, and speaking of, you know, the role of the media, we were talking a little bit earlier about the way the British press really take attacks the House for losing the war. At the same time, they're kind of idolizing Washington. Yeah, and the house and it becomes a big political issue. Who's responsible for losing the war? And yeah, the house absolutely. become a target for, again, one faction to which they don't belong. Can you talk a little bit more about this? About you know what happens when the house come home having yeah. not succeeded? Yeah, that's interesting because they actually started being attacked in the press in 1777 before they came mm -hmm. home, and it right. really infuriated them. I mean, there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. Um, but but this was, I mean, it's it's an interesting what happened to the house because you know in the Seven Years' War they really they were still young, you know they weren't, you know, William was a colonel by the end of the war, Richard was a commodore, they weren't admirals and generals, mm -hmm. um, and they were these dynamic military heroes. They, they got into the press, the public loved them. William had been part of the forlorn hope when Wolfe took Quebec, you know, he scaled the heights. He was in the vanguard scaling the cliffs and rushing out and scattering the sentries and, um, you know, in, in, in a something where he could easily have been killed. That's what he's best remembered for in terms of heroism. Um, and, and Admiral Howe had had distinguished himself on the coast of France in the Battle of Quiberon. You know, he, he, he chased these ships into dangerous shoals. And, you know, these things got into the newspaper in Britain. So they were considered these dynamic types. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then with the War of Independence, um, of course, you know, if, if, if you are a commander and you don't win, you know, that's it. It doesn't matter what reasons you give, you're going to be criticized. Right, right. And, and the British public were, were furious about this whole thing because, as I say, the war was supposed to be easy and people felt humiliated by it. So mm -hmm. caricatures grew up, particularly of William. And the caricature that grew up about William was that he was lazy, lazy mm -hmm. and slothful. Mm -hmm. And this was going to fit in with a growing view that even led up to World War I, where the British started seeing the upper classes as not fit Mm. To, to officer the army, you know, th this growing criticism that anyone who reads any military history about Britain will be aware of, say the Crimean War and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, and so, so William was, you know, he, despite the fact that this was nothing what he was, uh, of what he was actually like, um, he was, he was depicted as, you know, this lazy guy who couldn't be bothered. And um, this, this appeared in the newspapers. And at the same time, and I think this is because the British public had an ambiguous attitude towards the war. Washington was being mm -hmm. held up as the original type of a real British officer. Wow. He, I mean, he was actually given what were really 
English attributes. You know, he was noble, he endured hardships in the field, and yet he was also refined, you know, a gentleman. And, yeah. and, and he had also conspicuously not accepted pay. Right. And this was being contrasted with the House, who absurdly were being accused of dragging the war out to make money. Oh, <laughs> as if, <wow. laughs> if anyone knew the realities of it for them, oh, they would yeah. never think right. that. You know? yeah. um, so, so this actually part of the reason that William resigned was because wow. he felt that uh, the, the British, there was a, a British minister, Lord George Germain, yes. was deliberately feeding the press mm -hmm. with these stories about him that were designed to make him look um, mm. you know, lazy feet while Washington right. was held up as the proper. Um, and and right. in fact, his mother's last stand defending her sons surrounded, swirled around this because in January, 1778, a few months before the brothers came home, um, old lady Howe by now, the one who wrote the newspaper article um, was in a, in a drawing room uh, and she encountered Lord George Germain, who mm -hmm. she was convinced was maligning her sons in the press. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think Caroline was there too. And you could never stop Lady Howe, old Lady Howe from doing mm -hmm. anything. And she turned on Lord George Germain and said, wait till my sons get home, you wait. And she said, I wish I were a man. And in other words, it was an allusion to a duel. Right. Wow. <laughs> I think she'd wow. have done it. And that, yeah. that story got into the newspapers. Okay. You know, and that, that was kind of her last stand. She had heart problems by then. Oh. So I imagine Caroline was standing by thinking, oh, gosh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Great. We're, we're talking with Julie Flavel, who is the author of The Howe Dynasty, the story of this incredible family. So what does William do when he comes home? Oh, when, well, when he gets home from, from America, um, the, the, well, the first, the first thing he did was, he, well, he had to go to court. He had to meet with Lord George Germain um, and he, he met with the king. And what he, what he wanted, um, because this was a usual thing, was to be given some kind of recognition from the powers that be, from the crown, that showed not, not that he'd done a wonderful job in America, but that everything was fine. In other words, his career wasn't at an end. He would be employed in a future mm -hmm. war. And that could be something like, um, you know, a governorship of Plymouth or yeah. some kind of post. It could be a desk job, but something mm -hmm. that showed that right. you know, he wasn't being pushed out in the cold. And, and that, that was slow to come. Mm -hmm. And and so during the summer, um, and I think William really hated this. I mean, I, I, this is my private opinion, but I think he wouldn't have taken the job if he'd known how it was going to turn out. Because he, so, he was a very friendly, sociable person. Yeah. And, and in Nottingham, he, he became an object of hatred, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but he did. He showed up at the Nottingham races and, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And then he fell very, very ill. Um, you know, maybe people do fall ill when they've had it. Mm -hmm. And and I sometimes he he ended up in a house outside of London being nursed by all the women in the family. And so I just have this picture of going in a few months from commander in chief in mm -hmm. Philadelphia to mm -hmm. to this bedroom with you know a feather mm -hmm. bed and feather right. pillow and wow. the family yeah. immediately running. And and then uh, Richard came home uh, that autumn, and they then pushed to have an inquiry in Parliament mm -hmm. to exonerate them. And in the end. It ended inconclusively, but um, it, Lord North did say, you know, there's no reason that the House have done nothing mm -hmm. that we're particularly, you yeah. know, unhappy with, and and uh, mm -hmm. we would employ them again. After that, William lived quite quietly. Um, mm. He was an angler. Yeah. <laughs> I think okay. he went back to his country <laughs> pursuits. With with the ex he, he did continue to serve though, but just as, at desk jobs. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, they had been not in favor of the war as it seemed to be looming in 1774. And uh, one of, of course, the way we know about Caroline first, of course, is that she plays chess with Benjamin mm -hmm. Franklin in the fall of 1774. And this is a tremendous story. I wonder if you can give shed a yeah. little more light on Caroline Howe playing chess with Dr. Franklin. And yeah, it is a wonderful story. Yeah. Um, yeah, in, in summer, uh, now Benjamin Franklin was in London. Uh, he had been in London for several years as an agent for several American colonies, and he was considered the premier spokesman for America and London at that time. Um, but he was also by then considered to be a troublemaker. Um, mm -hmm. There was this feeling that he was the one sending information from London that was stirring up all the trouble. And so he was kind of persona non grata. Uh, but at the same time, there was an interest within the British government circles 
by just a few ministers, Lord Dartmouth mainly, um, uh, and finding some kind of peaceful solution because it looked as if things were sliding to war. So could there be some kind of formula put forward that would just stop the slide to war and you know end this crisis the way the other crises have been ended, the Stamp mm -hmm. Act and the Townsend Acts with some kind of fudge? Mm -hmm. um, and so Franklin was approached secretly by several individuals to have these very, very secret talks. And the only reason these talks are known about is because he wrote an account of them on his way home to America in March, 1775. Otherwise there would be no knowledge of these. And one of the people to approach him was Caroline Howe. She invited him to play chess. He, he went to a Royal Society meeting and a member of the Royal Society who was a friend of Caroline's approached him and said, there's a lady who fancies she can beat you at chess. Um, you may be flattered when you know who she is. It's the sister of Admiral Howe. And, and, and anyway, Franklin ended up taking up her challenge. Caroline was very competitive at games. And for quite a few weeks, they played chess. This was in autumn 1774 in her house in Grafton Street. But what this whole thing really was, was a cover because People were very, very nosy. It was a very short street. The Admiral's house is still there. He lived a few doors down. And people would have noticed if somebody like Bang Franklin came to visit Admiral House. So Car Caroline set this cover up with weeks of chess games mm. till the neighbors lost interest. And you know, why was Benjamin Franklin showing up at her door? And then on Christmas Day, she suddenly said, would you like to meet my brother, Admiral Howe? In came Admiral Howe mm. and he suggested do you think you could put together some kind of formula that might be acceptable to the British government um, that, that would also be acceptable to the Americans that I could present to someone in the administration? Mm -hmm. You know, they're all very secretive. And Franklin did that. And Caroline would copy everything he gave so that his handwriting wasn't handed to anyone in the ministry. He, she, mm -hmm. And she was present at every one of the meetings. The meetings didn't come to anything, but it's always been a bit of a mystery um, well, they did subsequently in that Lord Howe became peace commissioner, but they came to nothing immediately, obviously. You know, nothing was sorted out from them in the first instance. But it's always been a bit of a mystery how Lord Howe became involved in them because he didn't have any connections with Lord Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. But what I found out that it, it was Caroline who had the connections with Lord Dartmouth. She was involved mm -hmm. in a ladies' charity with Lady Dartmouth. Um, mm -hmm. Lady Dartmouth's baby was extremely ill. Caroline went to visit in early November, 1774. And the doctor in attendance was Dr. Fothergill, who was the other person who mm -hmm. approached Franklin separately to find a secret solution. Yeah. And so it's obvious that Caroline as a politically involved woman was talking to Lord Dartmouth, who was the minister, the only mm -hmm. minister in the cabinet who wanted to find a peaceful solution. You mm -hmm. know, with the sick baby upstairs and Lady Dartmouth wringing her hands. Yeah. They had yeah. a, some kind of confab, Dar uh, Father Gill, Dartmouth, and Caroline, and, and Caroline subsequently got her brothers involved. And I think that's how they got involved, because initially I think the House didn't particularly want to get involved in that war, nor did yeah. a lot of British military figures. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. And, you know, we can see, each, you know, Franklin was a very good chess player. In fact, he's in the chess hall of fame. So it's not a far-fetched thing that the chess would be. And um, chess is kind of a metaphor i guess it could be for a lot of things for yeah. others it's just a game but uh yeah in in, in in paris franklin would play and would um take his king off and say we we can play without a king <laughs> oh i didn't know that <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> yeah. So, yeah and so it's a fascinating story about what they are doing as they're meeting in the fall and um so she is really very much involved in the way oh, a woman yes. could be involved. But you make a point, she's not a feminist. She's not pushing to have a public role. No, no. I, I think Caroline Howe was an example of somebody who, um, you know, she lived in a society where, you know, men controlled property and they controlled politics. Mm -hmm. But she had a very, very good relationship with her brothers. Mm -hmm. And for them, the whole thing worked. They worked as yeah. a team. Mm -hmm. um, the how children had grown up, they'd actually grown up under a certain adversity, relatively speaking. Their, when mm -hmm. their father died when they were very young, the family was poor relative to aristocratic mm -hmm. standards. Yeah. Um, and I think it really developed a, a close sense of solidarity between yeah. them. And Caroline had a husband who, by chance, his name was Howe. That's mm -hmm. why her name is remained Caroline Howe, and her nickname was Howie, in fact. Ah. 
Her husband was older than her, and he mm. seems to me to have been a very pleasant guy, but somebody who didn't have a real strong personality, mm. and they never had children. Oh. So, so she really ended up very involved in the family dynastic mm. of her, mm. her brothers. Mm. And and they work very closely together. So I I don't think I think she's someone who, if you want to put it this way, she felt very much in in control of her own happiness. Mm. You know, for her the system worked. Yeah, and probably force of personality. I always think you know, Mr. Bumble and Oliver Twist said the law is a bachelor when yeah. he was told <laughs> that he was legally in charge of his wife. And right. I think yeah. Caroline's a good example that in the privacy of households. Mm -hmm. personalities probably are matter as much as anything. Right, right. We're talking with Julie Flavel, who is the author of The Howe Dynasty, about this extraordinary family. So are there male children then in any among the um, the Admiral or um, William to carry on the family dynasty after this? Oh, period? yeah, that's a bit sad. Um, and, it, and it shows, you know, the difficulty in, in an age when, when there was no medical recourse, if, if mm. people were infertile, if couples were infertile, you know, just how much more common this, this was. Um, uh, of, of, of all the house, uh, the only married house from that generation, from Caroline's generation to produce mm -hmm. children were Admiral Howe and his wife who produced mm. three daughters. Mm. Well. And, uh, George the Third, who really loved the house, he, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he thought Nelson led, led a private life that, that he disapproved of. But Richard Howe was was a consummate family man. Mm -hmm. and he thought he was a great guy, yeah. and they, they had always gotten along very well. He eventually gave him a title, um, a baron that could be passed on through a daughter. Oh, okay. As well as being Earl Howe. Wow. And wow. and so his daughter became his eldest daughter became Baroness Howe. Hmm. Um, and she had a son. So, but yeah, I mean, it was a slender thread that kept the house going because there is there is an Earl Howe now, hmm. who you know, is a descendant of Admiral Howe. But but out of all these ten children originally, hmm. it came down to that. It. It, it yeah, it. it is extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and, and the Howe's father, as well as the father of General Gage, had been the governors of Barbados, speaking of an English colony, mm -hmm. which should have a, a possible sinecure. And I understand that today Barbados is leaving the British Commonwealth. Yeah, but, I heard oh, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Charles went there to yeah, preside yeah. over it. I think he's one of the first royals who showed up to be kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> decided to be a good sport about it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's wow. right. Yeah. 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 So uh, this is... Um, now, another really interesting um, thing that comes through in the book is the, well, it is something we've talked about. Um, what happens when the house come to America? And there's another episode that I think looms really large is the peace conference on Staten Island with yeah. Lord Howe and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, and they're trying to avert the war. This is in the late summer of 1776, so it's after the Declaration of Independence and before, speaking of being kicked out, the British kicked the Americans out of New York. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, by then, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, well the, the, yeah, the Staten Island Conference, that's, that, that was the final meeting between effectively uh, American colonists and the British government before mm -hmm. America you know, until yeah. the end of the war. I suppose they weren't colonists by then because they they had the declaration. It depends on your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah, the Staten Island Conference was was the remnant of this attempt to come up with some kind of peace formula. You know, they, nobody had ever come up with a formula that made both sides happy. Really, the whole thing happened so quickly, I don't mm -hmm. think there was much of a chance. And for those who, who secretly wanted independence, like the Adamses, that was a very good thing. Um, I think the House felt that they'd been accused of, of wanting to set themselves up as, uh, sorry, I, sh I should say first, Richard was given a peace commission as well as being um, in charge of the Navy. And, and the Peace Commission gave him permission to open up negotiations with the colonists in rebellion under certain circumstances. They had to lay down all their arms and so on and so forth. Um, but he did everything he could to manage to have one negotiation 
with the congressional leaders. And this has been part of the reason there've been conspiracy theories because people have argued that the House tried to, if it's possible, fight softly, not, not be too mean, which I, I can't quite understand how anyone can do this with a bunch of bayonets and so on and so forth, but, but whatever. So, and, and, and with the hopes that this would coax the Americans into talking, whereas in fact, the House knew that the opposite was true, that the only way they were gonna get the Americans to talk is if they appeared to be some kind of irrepressible force and they knocked the heart out of the, out of the rebellion. Uh, but the, they did want to set up a talk and, and the idea that they pushed to do that is, is true because they knew perfectly well that there are people at home, friends of theirs, the Rockinghams, the Duke of Richmond, who didn't support the war, and they wanted to show everybody that they'd made an effort. And in, in the Congress, there were people who still weren't that convinced about going to war. Um, they wanted to, to explore anything that might be in the offing. And then there were other members of Congress who, of course, just wanted independence. And they thought, okay, to satisfy these people, we've just got to, it's as if both sides were going through the motions, to be honest, when they met on Staten Island. Um, but so so nothing actually came of it. It was a very short meeting. Um, it's too bad people didn't take more notes on the conversation because <laughs> I think it must have been fascinating. I, I, uh, one of the secretaries noted they made small talk for a long time, and I thought I wonder the picture of awkwardness. I wonder what that was like. Um, so. They had a very nice lunch with uh, the Adams writes about the the tongue and the mutton and the other things. And, um, yeah, that's and, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it it know, sounded like it was good. Yeah. There's a wonderful scene where Franklin, uh, where Lord Howe says that I feel like America as I do toward a brother. And if America should fall, I would feel as though I had lost a brother. Remember, he did had lost a brother fighting in America. That's right. They did feel like they had a personal stake in the whole thing. And then Franklin says, we will do our utmost to spare your lordship that mortification. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. With the yeah. Franklin Ray Party. That's that, right. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, and it's sorry, interesting and, because, because it, again, if you're thinking you need to bring in, you, you need to have reconciliation as opposed to just killing everyone. I mean, yeah, that was their it has, That's right. It, it was a, a rebellion. So yeah. th there weren't normal diplomatic channels. So there yeah. had to be something, some some way of the Americans saying, okay, we've had enough. We don't want to fight anymore. And that, and what, what this really was, was it wasn't a formula for a, a constitutional arrangement. It, it, it was yeah. a, a procedure by which the colonists could lay down arms right. and apply to right. elect another yeah. government and so on and so right. forth. But, you know, but, but this came to nothing and William took New York. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And by this time, too, I mean, uh, William had had that experience in Boston trying to hold on to he is the last um, royal governor of Massachusetts. And um, do you have any sense of how Bunker Hill affected him? I mean, that was really a bigger battle than the British had anticipated. And yeah, I, I mean, yeah. Uh, Bunker Hill. If only the Navy had taken soundings before the battle, right. they would yeah. have been able to protect the British troops and the whole thing would have been a walkover. Mm -hmm. And instead it was the absolute mess that everybody knows about where the yeah. British troops were mown down and they did take yeah. the hill, yes, but it was very much a Pyrrhic victory. I, I think William's basic take on that was that he, he felt that, I mean, he was used to fighting irregular troops. He'd done it in mm -hmm. Scotland, he'd done it elsewhere. And he felt that every time the British army did anything that made it look at all to the uh, untrained, unprofessional American soldiers as if maybe this could be easy after all, like the way Lexington and Concord appeared. Yeah. He was just gonna give heart to the rebellion. So he's desperate not to have these things happen. And mm -hmm. I think Bunker Hill did affect him in that sense and that he's always been accused of being extremely cautious Mm -hmm. And I think there's a there is some truth to that in that I think he was determined he didn't want I mean he won all the major battles he was in but but he didn't want uh, these these minor reverses like for mm -hmm. example Harlem Heights in New mm -hmm. York that that made the Americans you know that boosted the morale that kept the the whole thing going mm -hmm. and I mean, it was a very difficult road to hoe I, mm -hmm. I don't really think the British had enough backup for him in America, to be mm -hmm. honest. I, I think they just didn't realize what they were getting into, that the mm -hmm. level of um, truth yes. and so on they were, they were gonna need to put the whole thing down. Yeah. yeah, that could be too part of the argument with uh, 
Lord Germain, too, who's kind of overseeing this and the dispute about who's responsible for losing this. I mean, the Hows oh, yeah. are doing what they can with what they have, and then they're not being sent what they need. Yeah. And, yeah. Good. Exactly. So, yeah. 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 So we've been talking with Julie Flavel, the author of The How Dynasty, which is about the Hows, the um, the ones we know, the Lord How and General How, and then, of course, their sister, who is the real interesting character. Now, um, there have been a number of books written about the hows. So you have found a lot of things that are new. That is, we didn't know by looking at the the um, Caroline House correspondence. Is there more, do you think? I mean, is there material here for more books on um, this world of the political world of women in 19th, 18th century London? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the the... I, I think that you mean other other books on other women. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I mean, for example, uh, Burgoyne's wife was actually very active in promoting his mm -hmm. because she died in just just at the start of the War of Independence. So she was actually very active in promoting his image in mm -hmm. London. Um, Lord Rockingham's wife was, you know, virtually a politician herself. And there mm -hmm. have been books written about it by historians like Elaine Chalice, but I, right. I think there is a lot more that can be done. But but the other thing I think is that my book shows is that, you know, people talk about writing about people in context. Um, one of the things it suggests is that if you take, if you don't explore people's families very thoroughly, you really can miss a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, I think that's exactly right. I mean, families are important to people and you don't know what you're gonna come up with if, if you really start digging right. into the family background, the dynamics of the family they lived in, um, their feelings toward brothers and sisters and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And I, I think there's a lot to be revealed here. And, and the idea of writing about, if you do biography, writing about people totally out of context, like completely in their professional environment or something, you know, it, it really does weaken it. You know, you miss right. things. And it right. can be quite surprising what you miss too. You're right. And, and your book does a phenomenal job then of reconnecting and building this web that they lived in. It was their context. It was the way they understood the world. That is the, uh, the two brothers aren't acting alone, but they're part of this really yeah. extraordinary family network. That and, and, and it also, um, I mean, another, another story that's always swirling around William Howe is, is his relationship with Betsy Loring, you know, the supposed oh, mistress. Yeah. Added. And, and that that actually ties into the family thing too, because Betsy Loring, um, I mean, I I couldn't I actually to be honest when I went to it, I thought okay, I can have a, a you know a juicy salacious mm -hmm. section on him and Betsy Loring. I actually found very little evidence that that the whole story was even oh. true, and there have been a few historians who've questioned it. They said where mm -hmm. you know if he had a, this torrid affair with this woman, where is the you know actual Right. hard right. evidence that this ever right. actually happened. And and the reason I said it ties in with the Howe family is that the Lorings actually knew um, the Wentworths, who the governor of uh, New, New Hampshire, Hampshire. Yeah. wife. Uh, they were, the, the Wentworths were in Boston when William was there. They were taking refuge from patriots in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. um, Betsy Loring was so the, he, she supposedly began an affair with William as soon as he arrived there. In fact, she was four months pregnant. It, mm -hmm. Nobody ever bothers to research her. It's not actually right. hard to find out. She was four months pregnant. Yeah. Um, and when the baby was born in October, he was named John Wentworth Loring. So he was named after the Wentworths because mm -hmm. I think they became, they were employers and friends of the Lorings. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. point about the Wentworths is that they were friends with the house back in London. So the idea that what would have to be, if he had an affair with Betsy Loring, then he had an affair with a woman who might well be introduced to his wife if she went to London. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, her uncle had saved William's life during the Seven Years' War. He'd come to, um, he'd been mm -hmm. in Boston after um, the siege of Louisbourg and he'd fallen very ill. And um, this Dr. Lloyd, Betsy's uncle had saved his life and mm -hmm. her husband, had been with William at Havana in the Seven Years' War. So so this is in yeah. the 18th century, you didn't usually make mistresses out of people like that. I, I suppose right. it's possible, we all know how biology works, but it, mm. it's pretty unlikely. And and that is, you know, I, I uncovered that because I was looking at William's world from the mm. point of view of his family. Wow, that's fascinating. I wish we had more time to talk about it, because then how does a story like this begin? And yeah. when does the rumor start? 
it's the media again, yeah. the media attacks. She was central to um, the, the depicting William as lazy in bed most of the time. Right. Yeah. Loring, okay. with Mrs. Loring. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that was the, I don't know what she thought of it. I, I wish to goodness I could find a diary or something. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, that is, so thank you. Julie Flavel has been our guest. She is the author of The Howe Dynasty, the untold story of a military family and the women behind Britain's War for America, and I want to thank you, Julie, for joining us. Well, and thank you I, very much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. And, and you know, we were talking before about our listeners, and we actually do have people tuning in from all around Massachusetts, but also other places. For example, we have listeners in Nottingham, as okay. well as in Southampton in England, and in Northampton in, Pencil, in uh, Pennsylvania, and Edinburgh. So there are other folks in Scotland listening, as mm -hmm. well as Italy and all parts of the United States and the world. So thank everyone for Great. listening. If you have an idea for something we should talk about, send me an email, rallison at Suffolk, S-U-F-F-O-L-K dot E-D-U. And uh, thank you all for listening to the Rev250 podcast. And thank you, Julie Flavel, for writing the book and for coming to talk about it. Well, thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.